the symbolism of eagle, double-headed eagles and the constellation Aquila. Eagle is the common name for many large birds of prey of the family Achipitridae. Eagles are not a natural group, but the term describes any bird of prey large enough to hunt large vertebrates. The white-tailed eagle, for example, is a sea eagle, Alia etus albicilla, and a very close cousin of the American bald eagle. Most eagles are larger than any other raptors apart from some vultures. They have at least one singular characteristic. It has been observed that most birds of prey look back over their shoulders before striking prey. Predation is, after all, a two-edged sword, but not the eagles. Eagles have very large hooked beaks for ripping flesh from their prey. They have strong muscular legs and powerful talons and their eyes are very powerful with extremely large pupils. The martial eagle for example whose eyes are more than two times larger than the human eye, has a visual acuity up to eight times that of humans. This acuity enables eagles to spot potential prey from a very long distance, the etymologies of Isadora of Seville, 7th century AD, page 264. It is said they have such sight that when they soar above the sea on unmoving wings and invisible to human sight, from such a height they can see small fish swimming and descending like a bolt, seize their prey and carry it to shore. Thus so far the symbolism is straightforward. The eagle represents power and fearless, ruthless, merciless power power that is aware of everything going on in its kingdom and it has no hesitation in swooping down on its prey seizing it with its talons and tearing it to pieces Prometheus The Greeks chose to use the symbol of an eagle in the story of Prometheus. Prometheus defied the gods by stealing fire from them and giving it to humanity. Symbolically, stealing fire means tinkering with creation for man's benefit. Thus, genetic engineering is an example of stealing fire, as is devising chemicals to kill insects. As the creation is such a finely tuned system and was not designed for man's benefit alone, the punishment is equal to the crime. Zeus sentenced Prometheus to eternal torment for his transgression. He was bound to a rock and an eagle was sent to eat his liver. Prometheus's liver would then grow back overnight, only to be eaten again the next day in an ongoing cycle of torture. In other words, the myth is telling us not to tinker with nature, a system we do not understand, or worse, think we do, because the punishment will be a never-ending cycle of torture from which there is no escape. In effect, don't mess with nature, because nature will apply a punishment more agonizing than we can ever conceive.
the companion of Jupiter, Zeus. We have a video that describes the symbolism of the god Jupiter or Zeus. To see the symbolism of Jupiter. And in it we describe the relationship between the eagle and the god. Euripides, around 480 BC to 406 BC, tells us that birds in general are the messengers of the gods, but the eagle is king and interpreter of the great deity Jupiter. In myth, the eagle also carried Jupiter's thunderbolts. But Marcus Manilius, the author of Astronomica, made a very astute observation about the power the eagle represents. Manilius, Astronomica, 1st century AD, Book 5, page 341. This bird brings back the thunderbolts which Jupiter has flung, and fights in the service of heaven. He that is born on earth in the hour of its rising will grow up bent on spoil and plunder, one even with bloodshed. He will draw no line between peace and war, between citizen and foe. And when he is short of men to kill, he will engage in butchery of beast. He is a law unto himself, and rushes violently whenever his fancy takes him. In his eyes to show contempt for everything merits praise. Yet should perchance his aggressiveness be enlisted in a righteous course, depravity will turn into virtue. and he will succeed in bringing wars to a conclusion and enriching his country with glorious triumphs. And since the eagle does not wield, but supplies weapons, and seeing that it brings back and restores to Jupiter the fires and bolts he has hurled, in time of war such a man will be the aid of a king or of some mighty general and his strength will render them important service. The Constellation Aquila Aquila is a constellation on the celestial equator. Its name is Latin for Eagle and it lies in the Milky Way. Aquila was one of the 48 constellations described by the 2nd century astronomer Ptolemy. It had been earlier mentioned by Eudoxus in the 4th century BC and Aratus in the 3rd century BC, rather indicating that it was an important symbol. It is also now one of the 88 constellations defined by the International Astronomical Union, so it is worth exploring its symbolism some more, and to do this we will take a look at both the single eagle and the double eagle. And to set the scene, we must go back to the 12th and 13th centuries AD and trace the advance of the Mongol Empire. The Golden Horde Genghis Khan, 1162 to 1227, was the founder and first great Khan or Emperor of the Mongol Empire. After his death, the Mongol Empire became the largest contiguous empire in history. Genghis Khan came to power by uniting many of the nomadic tribes of the Mongol steppe, becoming the universal ruler of the Mongols. Once he had the tribes of Northeast Asia under his control, he set in motion 
the Mongol invasions, which ultimately witnessed the conquest of much of Eurasia. He led incursions by Mongol raiding parties as far west as Legnica in western Poland and as far south as Gaza. The so-called Golden Horde, established in the 13th century, was the northwestern sector of the Mongol Empire. The Horde's military power peaked during the reign of Uzbek Khan, 1312-1341 who adopted Islam. The territory of the Golden Horde at its peak extended from Siberia and Central Asia to parts of Eastern Europe. Ivan III As you can see from the map, the Kievan Rus territories in the 1200s were a mass of little fiefdoms that quickly fell to the advancing Golden Horde and became vassal states. Prince Michael of Chernigov was stabbed to death for his refusal to do obeisance to Genghis Khan's shrine. Meanwhile, the Fourth Crusade, 1202-1204, a Latin Christian armed expedition called by Pope Innocent III had sacked Constantinople, a Christian city. With one of the first cathedrals, the Hagia Sophia, now converted to a mosque, and all Orthodox Christianity and the Byzantine Empire would very soon be threatened. The threat was very real. This action by the Roman Pope could well have snuffed out Christianity altogether. In our video on the symbolism of the shield, we describe how it was only the action of Poland's John Sobieski in the 1500s that saved Vienna from becoming Muslim. And the leader who rose to save Kiev and Rus was Ivan III. Ivan III Basilievich, 1440-1505, was a member of the Rurik dynasty who had established themselves in Novgorod around the year AD 862. Ivan served as the co-ruler and regent for his blind father Vasily II from the mid-1450s before he officially ascended the throne in 1462. He was a very able ruler he multiplied the territory of his state through war and through the seizure of lands from his dynastic relatives. He renovated the Moscow Kremlin, introduced a new legal codex and laid the foundations of the Muscovian state. It was in the reign of Ivan III that the new Muscovite Sudebnik or law code was compiled by the scribe Vladimir Gusev, but his greatest achievement was his 1480 victory over the Great Horde. It is described as the restoration of Muscovian independence and came 240 years after the fall of Kiev in the Mongol invasion of Kiev and Rus. Ivan refused to pay the customary tribute to the Grand Khan Ahmed and in 1480 Ahmed Khan organized a military campaign against Muscovy. Throughout the autumn the Muscovy and Tatar hosts confronted each other on opposite sides of the Ugra River until the 11th of November 1480 when Ahmed retreated into the steppe. Why did he win? Ivan was undoubtedly a formidable and powerful leader. But beside him was his little eagle, his wife, Sophia Paleolog. Sophia. 
Iran's first wife died in 1467. The Vatican, desperate to unite the Orthodox and Roman Catholic empires they had so treacherously divided, attempted to sponsor the marriage of Ivan and Sophia Zoe Paliogene in the hope of bringing Moscovia under the sway of the Pope. Sophia Zoe Paliogene was a Byzantine princess and niece of the last Byzantine emperor, Constantine XI. Ivan married her in 1472, but it was clear Sophia had a mind of her own. Even before she departed for Muscovian lands, it became apparent that the Vatican's plans to have Sophia represent Roman Catholicism stood no chance. Her faith was Orthodox Christianity, and Orthodox Christian she was going to stay despite the political manoeuvrings of the Roman Catholic Pope. Indeed, the papal legate, Antony, was not even permitted to enter Moscow. And it would appear that Ivan was smitten by his new strong-willed, independent, orthodox wife. The princely family increased significantly between 1474 and 1490, as the Grand Princess gave birth to eleven children, five sons and six daughters. Special mansions and gardens were built for Sophia in Moscow, so that she felt a bit more at home. She was not obliged to follow the custom of isolation that was practiced by elite Moscovian women and she did not confine herself to the Terems, the women's quarters. Ivan developed a complicated court ceremonial on the Byzantine model, and under Ivan and his son, Vasily III, Moscow started to be called the Third Rome. Philotheos, a monk from Peskov, even promoted the idea of Moscow as the true successor to Byzantium and hence to Rome. In other words, although the Roman Pope had succeeded in destroying the home of Orthodoxy by sacking Constantinople, Sophia was determined it would rise again and find a new home in the land of her husband Ivan. But there were those who feared that Ivan was softening up. Before the invasion of Ahmed in 1480, Vissarion, Bishop of Rostov, warned him that his excessive attachment to his wife and children would be his destruction. And indeed Ivan arranged for Sophia, her children, household and treasury to be sent away, first to Dimitrov and then on to Belazersk, for fear Ahmed would finally take Moscow. But Ivan did not lose, and it seems that the Grand Khan, while preparing a second expedition against Moscow, was suddenly attacked, routed and slain by Khan Ibak of the Nogai Horde, whereupon the Golden Horde fell to pieces. In 1487, Ivan reduced the Khanate of Kazan, one of the offshoots of the Horde, to the condition of a vassal state. So he may have had excessive love, but it seemed to produce positive, not negative results. In fact, with the other Muslim powers, the Khan of the Crimean Khanate and the Sultans of Ottoman Empire, Ivan's relations were peaceful and even amicable. Ivan did his utmost to please Sophia and make his capital a worthy successor to Constantinople and Moscow became a centre of creativity and learning. Many foreign masters and artificers settled in Moscow. One of these 
was the Italian Ridolfo di Fioravanti. Nicknamed Aristotle because of his extraordinary knowledge, who built several cathedrals and palaces in the Kremlin and also supervised the construction of the Kremlin walls. And Ivan's reign was a period of stability. His 43-year reign was the second longest in the history of the Muscovian state after that of his grandson Ivan IV. The Double-Headed Eagle Sophia belonged to the house of Paleologos, a Byzantine Greek family, and this is Constantine XI, Paleologos, 1449 to 1453, the final Byzantine emperor. The Double-Headed Eagle was their emperor, and Sophia took it with her to Muscovia where it became both the symbol of orthodoxy and the symbol of Muscovia. Why the double head? The heads are intended to show that any ruler in a position of great power has a dual responsibility. He must attend to the secular and the spiritual. And Sophia provided the spiritual input to match Ivan's secular. All those countries that aligned with orthodoxy employed this motif in their flags or coats of arms. It was in some ways a way of very visibly showing their disapproval of the treachery of Rome and the Fourth Crusade and their support of the Greek Orthodox teachings of the Apostle Andrew. Thus we have, for example, the coat of arms of Serbia. The coat of arms of Muscovia and the modern Russian Federation. The coat of arms of Albania. The ancient and accepted Scottish rite of Freemasonry. The coat of arms of Chernihiv Oblast, Ukraine. The coat of arms of Montenegro. The flag of Montenegro. And the flag of Mount Athos. Romania's flag is currently a demonstration of a flag completely misaligned with its populace, as 81.9% of the population identified as Romanian Orthodox Christians. In contrast, the single-headed eagle, Aquila, became associated with the Roman Empire and Roman Catholicism, and almost seemed to take on the personality of the old Roman Empire. Germany, Austria, Poland, even though a considerable number of people are Orthodox Christian, although it is a white eagle. Moravia, a historic part of the modern Czech Republic, now Protestant rather than Roman Catholic, and New Mexico. The single heraldic eagle was used as a Roman standard. It was then adopted by the Second German Empire, 1871-1918, to the Weimar Republic, 1919-1933, to and finally Nazi Germany, 1933-1945. to The same design has remained in use by the Federal Republic of Germany since 1945, albeit under the name Bundesadler, Federal Eagle. A number of non-Christian countries also use the single eagle, for example, Egypt, Iraq, Palestine, 
Syria, Yemen. Perhaps it might be better to abandon Aquila with his cruel talons, his ruthlessness, his merciless power, and that beak tearing its prey to pieces. And remember that Jupiter's eagle was gentle enough to carry Ganymede, the shepherd boy, to the gods, so that he could become Aquarius.